Welcome everyone to Talking Landscape Photography. Um, tonight we have an extremely special guest, um, one of my uh, personal uh, childhood heroes, I guess, of photography, Steve Parrish. Um, and so we're really excited to have him with us tonight. Also joining us, of course, is Paul Holen and Nick Monk. Gents, welcome. Um, should be a good one. Yeah, there's few people alive that uh, they have the breadth of experience that steve's had in, in this genre so he's seen this about every transition from from film to stills to video to to um, digital to digital art and and he's kept this incredible thread with nature alive sort of all the way through and and he's managed to share it with probably more people in the world than than many people probably have or ever will and with a wealth of uh, life experience and stories that I can only even imagine will scratch a tiny bit of a surface of Steve. So thank you for taking a little bit of time out for us. Really appreciate it. No problem. And maybe we need to sign it. Scratch your ear if you want me to shut up. <laughs> I, think it's a, um, I don't know if there's going to be much ear scratching, Steve. I, I think we're very keen Steve. to hear what you have to say. I do, I do go on. I'm guilty of going on. <laughs> All right. I'm, no. I'm, I'm, as my as my uh, general manager, it was the early two thousand. Said, "Why do you have to put so many pictures in books? You know, I mean, it, it costs money." I said, "No, it doesn't. The printer it doesn't matter whether there's one picture or, or six pictures. Well, we've got to scan them and we've got to edit them, and you know, <laughs> can't we make this more profitable?" <laughs> <laughs> so oversupplying. Um, somebody actually asked, "Oh, so, sorry, um, Nick, you." <laughs> I love your background, mate. I'd like to be there. Um, that that looks, actually looks very similar to the creek on our property. We've been we've been very fortunate. Um, when we lost the house in Brisbane after the floods, we finished up buying um, a coveted little ten acres uh, in 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 the Blackall Ranges between Mullaney and uh, Landsborough, tucked away with a really bad dirt track and they couldn't sell it because of the dirt track. And when I saw the dirt track, I thought, well, you know, no one's going to burgle me. <laughs> and, and the house is sort of really hidden, but, you know, th th that. But it's got a beautiful creek and it's a family commune and we've got, we've got um, two one and 14-month-old uh, kids. My, my, my um, middle daughter... Uh, lives in a bunch of cont containers. They put a whole lot of containers together in the bush. So I'm living. I'm living with two 14 month old babies and a six year old. Yeah, wow. So it's quite. It's quite an interesting. Um, I've had four wives, and um, I'm bringing this up because it is relevant. And and that is, that is one one of the one of the roadblocks. I love to talk about roadblocks in people developing their creative lives is they feel they can't strike out on their own. And this is particularly relevant to women uh, and, and, and women in the, in the sort of 28 to 50 bracket, uh, maybe 45. You know, they've got family commitments and, you know, a husband that doesn't necessarily, <laughs> doesn't necessarily share their, um, their love of nature and, going away on trips and it's very 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 common actually and so they feel a little isolated and so the people people are really particularly now having come out of coming out of being restricted and let's not use that c word um, because these issues were around long before the c word came up yeah. uh, is, is is striking out and and what i've done with the the woman that i'm with now after 23 years we negotiate all the way and, and, you know, we have coffee every morning, uh, coffee in the evening. She lives her life independently. I actually live in my studio. I, I wake up looking into the forest. Uh, it doesn't matter whether it's 1 o'clock in the morning or 3 o'clock in the afternoon. I do 24-7 creative life. And, of course, there's some challenges at the moment because c cash flow has been uh, knocked around for all of us. Mm. Absolutely. Um, you know, there's not many people... My heart goes out to the people running tours, particularly mm -hmm. international tours. Um, and even if they come on stream tomorrow, it doesn't mean you're going to click back in. And uh, but we 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 were forced to end our publishing in twenty in twenty what year is it 20, 2022, 2021 July. The people that took over from me 
after the flood, we were forced to sell. Uh, and I work under, I work with them. I, I was going to say under. <laughs> That's another life challenge. You know, being your own creative decision maker and then all of a sudden your brand has been run by someone else. Mm -hmm. uh, that is a challenge. Yeah, for the ego. Ego. <laughs> and also, I guess, um, you know, uh, they they might not have the same vision or values that you do, and so um, well they don't they, yeah. they, they, they don't and never will. Yeah, uh, I mean, my my company was started in eighty five, and we I had people from day one, and it ended in twenty twelve February twenty twelve. The the flood came. The, the the this is all relevant because people are losing stuff. The, you know, a lot of professional photographers, um, AIPP approached me. They've approached me three times over the last 10 years, to talk about recovery after loss. Um, I do. I have been through it and it's tough. And um, what I promote and very heavily promote in the masterclass is that if you, if you actually build a life purpose like you guys are, you know, you're developing, you've got a vision for what you want to do, uh, you're going ahead and doing it, you're making little adjustments, I sense that you're very open uh, for the opinions of others, but in the end, you'll make your own decisions. Uh, but that that, um, that having having that, um, uh, I call it a battering ram. I mean, and mine is to inspire others to connect to nature for their own mental, spiritual, physical well-being. In other words, you know, here's, here's, here's free Medicare, here's free health insurance. And then when you, it's been my life experience, when you run into those roadblocks, you know, like divorces or <laughs> helicopter crashes. Uh, I've been in one of those, a second flight in the Navy crashed into the ocean. Uh, you know, um, car leaving the highway. I've got pictures of all this. Last <laughs> last year, I had a triple bypass. Uh, I went to the doctor with numb feet and he said, you got a week to, well, he didn't say you got a week to live, but after tests, they said seven to 10 days and, oh. and you're out of here. That, that, that was interesting, and that was that was the birth of COVID. It was March 2020, actually, and I, I was I was in and out six times, nearly left the planet. Mm. But what what I've learned, and the thing that I like to share that's valuable to me, and I'm sure valuable to others, is bringing that purpose in. Uh, in the masterclass, we we start off with document documenting what is your purpose. Um, it's not your voice. Your voice is obviously photography. I found my voice as a direct result of this creature. Is he up yet? <laughs> uh, we'll get there. <laughs> Just for those at home, um, Steve's got a, a relatively slow internet connection, so um, we'll have to... I'll, I'll leave it up until you've seen it because yeah. um, that was the 1960 uh, life-changing encounter. Um, and, and I also wanted to talk uh, today about pivotal moments and being aware and awake and to, to recognise a pivotal moment and to seize it when it comes up. I was 16, spearfishing, yeah. and I was, I was um, continually down at Aldinga Beach in South Australia. It's a renowned area. Yeah. Uh, at a time when people, there weren't many people spearfishing, there was certainly no one taking underwater photographs. In fact, there was one person in Australia um, taking underwater photographs, certainly for conservation. And I went to the museum and inquired to what this great big thing is that keeps swallowing my fish. I knew it was a shark, but there were no books on sharks. And fortunately, I ran into uh, the, uh, a very empathetic and very encouraging um, curator of fishes at the uh, South Australian Museum. I lived just down the road. I used to love going to the museum. And he invited me on a fish collecting expedition to Kangaroo Island uh, and wanted me to use a net, not a spear gun. I was a spear fisherman, but he didn't want me to punch holes in them. He wanted me to capture, capture small fishes living in kelp, like the clinids and the blennies and these sorts of things. It was on the northern side of Kangaroo Island. And so um, that was, you know, for a 16-year-old. By the way, I'd already left school and, and uh, I, was, I was getting ready to take up a job as an apprentice jackaroo. My, my, my schooling ended in grade seven primary school. So I didn't actually have a formal education. I'm not sure how I learned to read, actually. I've been trying to figure out um, how I learned to read and write because I have no memory of anyone actually teaching me. Oh. Anyway, 
Anyway, <laughs> osmosis. Yeah, so, so on that trip was a very generous-hearted person. Uh, his name was Ego Oak. He was a Latvian man. He's still alive. He's in, in his high 80s. And he reached out to me. And it was, it, was that, it was that reaching out of a passionate, caring, senior individual to someone else that they felt uh, was open because I was shooting things uh, with guns, not with cameras at the time. And so we formed the South Australian Underwater Photographic Society with a membership of two. <laughs> and <laughs> two years later, I joined, I joined the Royal Australian Navy and took that embryonic passion for fish and, um, and, and, and photography and trying to capture fishes in their natural environment. And all the way through my career, I've had these pivotal moments. And I did a newsletter based on pivotal moments. And, of course, that was the most important. The second one was a scientist hooking me into fish taxonomy because I wanted my fishes identified. I'd moved to the East Coast. I was photographing fish, you know, reasonably well photographed. Um, and I wanted to know what the hell they were. Um, there was nothing. There was no, you know... Of course, there was no internet. You couldn't Google the fish. Now, God, it's a pink one. It's got a short body. It's got a big round. I mean, there it is. But anyway, um, he introduced me and he added value. So there's a kid, there's a kid without self-esteem having someone embrace what they're passionate about and in, in, in encouraging them to continue to pursue. So... Um, this is originally asked and was cancelled due to COVID, but uh, to, to speak to a um, rainforest conservation group down at Byron Bay. And the title was, I'm only one person, what can I do? And you know, you guys know exactly what the title is. What do you shoot yourself? Do you shoot the guy behind the bulldozer? Um, <laughs> I was trying to blow things up in the Navy. You can blow it up in the dead of night. That doesn't really win friends. Um <laughs> How do, you, how do you deal with the angst, with the anger, with the, dare I say, rage <laughs> of what we see happening around us? And my, my talk, which I never did get to put together, but it would have been around um, reach out, encourage some, even if it's one person, uh, bring passion, bring empathy, bring encouragement into the life of another and another and another and another and another. And for me, it started because my mother was a Pentecostal preacher. She really wasn't interested in fish. And she wasn't very interested in the fact that I wasn't interested in her, her, her spiritual teachings at all. Um, and, and so, you know, there's a little boy tugging on his mother's apron strings, going out into the world wanting, have a look at this crazy creature. Have a look at this crazy creature. Which is what we all do, isn't it? We we we're all. I mean, I think it was you, Luke, talking about crawling up on top of uh, Arthur Range and yep. waking up at dawn and getting you know beautiful backlit pandani with lakes in the background. These are the things that drive us. So that 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 is that is the passion, but it's not necessarily not necessarily it's not necessarily definable as a purpose. So voice passion. Purpose. So, when I when I move move through the modules, modules, I, I go from I go from uh, creating a creating a draft purpose, and people often get bogged there because they they want it to be perfect straight away. Yeah, a draft purpose. Look at how you can nourish it. How do you nourish a purpose? And it's not just going on a field trip and taking better pictures. You can nourish nourish it through. I mean, I, I nourish my creative life at night listening to, you know, YouTube videos. You know, wonderful stuff that's out there. Uh, so all much, sorts of people. Yeah. Oh, Pretty wonderful much you stuff. name it, isn't it? Yeah, you, you latch onto this teacher that's, that's very articulate and they're able to put, it, put in um, um, different language behind, uh, you know, whatever it is that you're, you're uh, wanting to do. And so then, of course, we hit the roadblocks. You know, I'm not good enough. There's too many people doing it. I do private sessions here with people, you know, men and women, and they always bring up, well, what's the point? 
well, they're not you. They're not, they're not expressing <coughs> your voice. They're not expressing their art. Um, th this, is, this is all about you. This is all about you. In fact, one of them last week, and it came to me, asked me, what's the most important word that you've learned? I mean, I'm 76, <laughs> bumping along the way since, since I was 16. I've been interested in nothing else. I don't have friends unless they relate to my spiritual or nature journey. I don't drink. <laughs> I've never been a party boy. I've always been totally focused. And the word I come up with is naivety. So, Steve, um, just um, to interrupt, um, we've also got a special guest um, host that's just joined us. You may recognise. Um... Oh, <laughs> surprise. <laughs> I was on chat roulette and then I click next and I'm in, I'm in this channel. <laughs> God, God, God bless you. We're just talking about naivety. <laughs> um, when when naivety when naivety I mean even even for me now I sometimes flick onto someone oh, I go, oh Jesus this guy's brilliant or this woman is brilliant and you get those little things inside saying you know oh my pictures aren't good you start you start querying yeah. so I was very lucky that you know in my early years particularly with the publishing where you take the most amazing financial risks. Tens of thousands of dollars, sometimes the risk. I was into the Commonwealth Banking mid 90s for $3 million. And they got started getting nervous. So you're spending a lot of money, so you're taking a lot of risks. But there's no one to ask. <laughs> you can't go to social media. You can't uh, you know, talk to your buddies because there aren't any buddies. There's no one doing what you do. Yeah. So where do you seek counsel? Well, you seek it with yourself. And particularly when we're wanting to uh, express ourselves artistically, this is why I love the digital, uh, I, I don't like the word digital art. I'm, I'm, trying, I'm trying, to, trying to find the right word now. I like playing with images because I love to inspire other people to play with their images and have fun. So I started doing that to, to, to uh, re-access what I've carried my whole life, which is a lurking abstractionist. I love colour and drippy and, you know, people like Mr Turner in, in the 17th century with all the scratchy, runny, you know, that's the stuff that I'm into. You know, super realism is fine if you wanted to tell a story about a parrot's sex life. Um, but if you, want to, if, you, if, you want to, if you want to, if you want to, if you want to enter the ethos of that parrot and celebrate its colour and its, you know, relationship with where it lives and you just want to let it run, you just want to let it run free. I'm just interested in the uh, evolution of you getting into that more um, digital space and um, obviously um, it's more of a... Oh, it started thing. a long time ago. All oh, right. Yeah. Yeah, I was, I was an oil painter to start with and I used to throw... Uh -huh. In fact, one of the first things I ever painted was a white pointed shark. Uh, and and I, I loved I loved uh, my, and somebody stole the the oil paints and the canvases at art college, uh, art school was a you know private art school that I went to, uh, and and I sort of gave it up. And it was 1974 while working for Queensland Parks as a photographer interpreter um, that I did a workshop at Binnaburra called Creative Arts Workshop. Oh, they used to be fantastic. And one of the teachers up there was a woman by the name of Irene Amos, uh, who's, who was a massive influence in my life. Another pivotal moment, if you like, this crazy, loud, confident, abrupt, lovingly abrasive <laughs> woman. I know what art is. Art is what I do, she used to say to students. And so she, she gave me a little book called, <coughs> it's a highlight in my uh, module one, what is art all about? What is art all about? And it's book, a book by Desiderius or Ban. It's out of print. If you're lucky to find one, it'll cost you between 80 and $100. They're rare now. Mine was flooded and I lost it and I had all these yellow pen marks. He was a realist until he was 80. He became abstract, an abstractionist at 80. He died at 104. And when, he, when you read his interpretation of what art is, you don't have to go far into the book to get really rocked 
I'll give you an example. My favourite quote, Desiderius or Ben, there's more art performed by overweight businessmen doodling on their blotters while making international calls by the mentally insane, by children as yet influenced by the broader world and hangs in all the galleries of the world combined. <laughs> now, you might say, oh, he's up himself. He's up himself. And then you read <laughs> See, that on. Sound, that sounds like freedom. Uh, There's a certain freedom from boundaries and judgment, I think, exactly, that, that those, exactly. those correlate to. Paul, you, 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 you're spot on, Paul. It's about letting go preconception. You know, what's it going to look like framed? What's it going to look like? <laughs> what's it going to look like? Uh, you know, how much should I sell it for? So when I when I started going into the in, in more into the digital art, um, and I, ha I had an exhibition that was co-hosted by Mental Illness Fellowship Australia and also Bush Heritage Australia, who actually invested fifteen thousand dollars in in helping launch the exhibition, and it was a way of going public and getting media attention to talk about this whole concept of playfulness and joyfulness and uh, getting getting out of the mind story. I was I was starting to wake up to the fact that so much, so much of our issues, so much of the crap that we go through, which affects health, gave me heart disease, stress, anxiety. I had cancer in, in, in the mid-90s. I've got two scars that are sort of joined together now. <laughs> um, and and, and, and you know, a lot of unhappiness, a lot of relationship breakdowns, et cetera, et cetera. This constant overthinking stories that we tell ourselves and so what I found what I found and I, I still feel it today enormous joy just disappearing into playing with these images I'm just in the process of deleting most of them I've started again they're not on the, on a site yet and because I've now lost publishing and I'm looking around am I going to earn a few bucks um, I'm going to bring them back and some of the digital artists out there aren't going to like me because I'm going to sell them not as cheap as you, Rick. <laughs> <laughs> Have a go. Have a go. Well, not everyone's got an Order of Australia medal, which kind of helps bump things up a little bit, <laughs> Steve. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm, I'm sort of going through this and, and I'm starting to go through the same emotion you do. We all go through it. You know, um, we, you know what will people think? I'm going to be more public with it. What happens if they don't sell? You know, um, and to be perfectly frank with you, doesn't really matter. Doesn't really matter. Uh, anyway, we, we we did that exhibition, and I think it was the first day somebody wrote in the in the comments book. Uh, I've been collecting his books all my life. I love his photography, but looking at this work, I think he's gone mentally insane. <laughs> <laughs> Goodness me! <laughs> and rather than take that as a hurtful, hurtful comment, uh, I, I loved it. I loved it. I look at some of those files now, and I've still got some of the prints here. <laughs> I look at them now, and I think, "Oh God!" But I'm working at working hard. At, and by the way, it's not a work in the park, walk in the park. There's a whole range of styles, and I think a lot of photographers are, are, are locked in this idea. Um, my favorite. This is my favorite topic. We're getting into manipulation. Oh, it's been photoshopped. Like Photoshop's the only tool. I mean, really. Um, and I, I, sat, I sat down with three middle-aged men. Um, when I say middle-aged, no, probably in my vintage over Christmas that were going on quite independently, not because they didn't know what I was doing. And I said, well, do, have you ever considered, there's two issues I'd like to raise. One is that the camera is a computer and you, your camera is processing your images. You know, if you go raw, okay, that's fine. But if you're going to shoot in JPEG, which 99.9% .9 of all photographs take, and particularly on phones, they're all created with algorithms. And, I mean, the, the phone takes most pictures these days. Yeah, computational photography. So if, yeah. if you're talking about, yeah, if you're, taking, if you're taking that stance, use a standard lens, don't make any adjustments in your camera, and that's the beginning. Yeah. <laughs> then it depends on the screen you look at. If the screen you're looking at. But what it comes back to is, is, and then very quietly saying, not getting upset, by the way, like a lot of people do when they get challenged. Uh, then, it, then it comes back to the fact that um, 
Okay, if a sculptor can play, um, a conductor doing Rachmaninoff's fifth might have instruments that Rachmaninoff didn't know existed or, you know, didn't exist. Mm. Um, all of the other art forms have freedom to play and express. There is an ethic, though, that lies on it with photography because photography is also about reporting factual information. So when it slides into journalism or it slides into, um, uh, you know, manipulating a bird to look like one that's extinct or something of that nature, there's an ethic involved in that. Yeah, I think wilderness photography uh, probably also, fits into that as well. Like people yeah, want to yeah, represent yeah. nature how it was and, and almost as a record-keeping kind of uh, process, yeah. Or, or, and I'll challenge that, or how they felt in that moment in time. Like that image, that image, by the way, of that I put on Facebook last night needs to be seen dead, <laughs> <laughs> and it needs to be printed and blown up because a lot of those images. Oh, just, it all does, Steve. It all does. Yeah, yeah. But going along that river, I'm I, I'm interested in reflecting back to the moment, being under the awning, going down in that beautiful clinker boot built boat, going down the pine. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Pouring with rain, absolutely pouring with rain, and revisiting. The emotion, you know, I'm not, I mean, I've just done a round Australia guide and the images pr principally in that are, you know, this is the Pyman River, this is the Arthur River, this is the distance between, the difference between them. Don't miss, don't, don't knock one out for the other because they're very different places. Mm. One you go upstream, the other one you go downstream. You know, uh, th th that, that's where you get into the, what's the vegetation, the sassafras, you know, the bl beautiful blend of, botanical elements on the riverbank, et cetera, et cetera, or how I felt in that moment in time in the pouring rain when the two sea eagles flew by. Mm. So they're two completely different experiences. And mm. by the way, the audiences are vastly different too. Yeah, that's right. I, I, I reach out to audiences that are, that are, you know, vastly different than the photographic. Yeah, and I think that's that's a bit of a difference in, to some degree. I feel like there's a lot of photographers that are, are putting out images to impress other photographers, um, and w whereas your approach is that, you know, there's a lot more people interested in in this work than just photographers themselves, and so that's a, a pretty big uh, acknowledgement and probably shows your um, read and understanding of the wider uh, marketplace, I suppose, as it is. Well, tapping, tapping emotion, I'm... Working with a guy at the moment, I won't name him, but he's he's global, he's big, and he's wanting to get access to my pictures. Um, he, he's, he's a spiritual teacher and he's very embedded in nature. He, he's quite brilliant, but he he won't go. He doesn't want to go on Facebook. He doesn't want to engage with those people on Facebook, and he only wants to engage with people. It used to be the physical world, and now he's doing it on Zoom. He's kind of liking it because he's eighty four and doesn't have to fly all over the world. And, deal with, particularly in the United States, deal with, you know, security and all of that sort of stuff. But what I said to him, that audience and the lessons that you will learn through one-on-one -on -one connection, I visit probably 80% of the pages that people comment, I visit their pages and I have a look at who they are. And when it comes to profile, I won't friend anyone that I haven't had a look at, okay? Because wow. I, I don't want to bring more, more, more hate and <laughs> conflict. And so my my um, my modus operandi is joy. It's about joy. It's about optimism. It's about empathy. It's about connection. Uh, and, and that 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 is the that is the the framework, which I actually stumbled into. Uh, as a young fellow, I was 30, working for the Park Service, and I went to Kakadu, and it was just about a year before the park was declared, and I had a friend up, that lived up there, and Ian Morris went on to become the senior train, Indigenous training officer. He speaks many languages. He writes several of them. He grew up with the Indigenous people, highly regarded human, and a dear friend going back almost 50 years. And he introduced me to Mr Kakadu, um, the Right Honourable Mr Bill Naichi, who's now passed, he actually decided to have his wake before he died, which is a really good idea. I was thinking about that. 
Yeah. Not sure who I'd invite though. <laughs> <laughs> but everybody came. They came from around the world. They came. There were politicians, filmmakers, etc., uh, etc. Et but when I when I met him, we, I had an opportunity to sit with him overlooking the Kakadu. It's Gagaju is the language. Uh, the, the 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 top end of Kakadu, and having him express how the land became the land that it is, how it was formed, uh, and he spoke with such compassion. Uh, and I use his quotes. In fact, there's one I'm feeling. I feel it with my body. I feel it with my blood. Oh, <laughs> this is. When the wind blow, he coming through you because you like that. He, he writes like this. Very deep. <sighs> yeah. He still affects me today. Beautiful. Um, and I, I was working for the government. I was working for National Parks and Wildlife Service. God bless them because they gave me a great opportunity. Full of competition, criticism competitiveness, they've got the bigger desk. I just got two little ones because I didn't have a degree. I got two little ones and put them together. <laughs> so my, desk, my, desk, my, my desk was actually bigger than the others. But, you know, and I was becoming very burdened and I'd been there from 75 to uh, 81. And I came back from this particular session with Bill. And it wasn't the fact that... It, I actually talk about this in my Around Australia Guide. I've dedicated the whole series to Bill. A uh, huge influence. Not because he was Indigenous, because I've, I've really soul-searched on this, but because he fearlessly, unconditionally uh, expressed emotion. I loved it. And it had, it had such a, an effect. Um, and I thought, Jesus, all bottled up, all locked up, all, you know, and I wanted to speak. I wanted to, I'm, I'm more interested in writing and speaking these days. I haven't taken too many pictures in the last couple of years. Um, but, yeah, it, it had such an effect. I came back to Brisbane. I went in to see my boss and I resigned on the spot. Whoa. From the only job I've ever had in my life uh, that I didn't mind going to work. But there was this element growing, 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 growing. Uh, you know, and, and of course it was the Joe Bianchi Peterson era. And what I'd come to see is that we'd become competitive animals in this because conservation can be, as you know, <laughs> it can be pretty vicious. Uh, conservation groups, one against the other, opinions of people. Uh, and and, and uh, I, I thought that if all we're doing is talking to people that are already converted, they're already coming to the parks. Um, you know, it's wonderful to go out and, you know, with the zoologist and photograph Herbert River ringtails, which I didn't know existed, and get, you know, introduced to and fall in love with the philandrids, the possum. You know, I've, I've, I've accumulated all but two species. And, you know, really passionate people that are into quail or red kangaroo behaviour or, you know, <laughs> I mean, the possum guy. He was going through with wives too because they didn't like living with the possum. <laughs> he, he, he painted all the walls in his house black so that they'd feel at home during the day. Wow. Uh, <laughs> absolute stunning guy, absolutely stunning guy. Uh, and the level of humility, and I was 30 and we, I, was, I was out hunting for this Herbert River ringtail possum. But by the way, they'd made it the logo, but they didn't have a photo of it. <laughs> And I only just joined them. And I, I lied at the interview because I was an underwater photographer, not a terrestrial one. And they said, you know, what experience? And I said, oh, I'm pretty good. And he said, well, bring some stuff in next week. So I raced up to Lemington National Park one hot Sunday, <laughs> found, found a land mullet and a brother and took a picture with a house of a lad, went home and did a great big sexy black and white print. I used to do that in those days. Uh, and took him in there the next day and he wanted me to write something. So I did the lizards of two worlds, the, the lurking carnivore, the lizard fish and the land mullet. They're both, if you like, even though they live in different ecosystems, one underwater, one terrestrial. They're lurking carnivals. Their behaviour is all around lurking. So I wrote this corny little piece 
and uh, I, I got the job. I got the job. Uh, and, and after being in the Navy, you know, military life is pointless. There's, there's not, no, there's, gee, I had the young recruits. Um, it, it actually did a lot for me because I was in search and rescue and used to whiz, whiz around in helicopters, so it was kind of sexy. But, <laughs> yeah, uh, having, having that, uh, I, went, I went out and I thought, I'm going to turn people onto nature, um, but I'm going, to, I'm going to try and come up with ways of doing it that actually brings benefit to their lives. Is that um? So you you is that um? You're doing that still while you're working with the park service, or when you yeah. sort of quit, you also that was a, like a natural extension. You're already doing that, and now you are sort of un unencumbered. Well, I was doing it in the navy. I was oh, I was right. writing. I was I was I immediately started writing stories about fish. Yeah, corny. My first book, Australia's Ocean of Life. Jesus, mother. Um, <laughs> it was described by Jesus, by, mother. Yeah, I still do that. It's my mother's influence. Um, um, yeah, somebody described it as a piece of anthropomorphic literature of fine quality, which was an insult. And I thought it was a compliment, but I didn't know what anthropomorphic was. And so I went to the dictionary and, and, and then realised it was actually a criticism, the assignment of human emotion to animals, because I didn't, no one had sort of taught yeah. me how to write about these things. So um, I, I'd sort of, you know, when I wrote about fish, I did it with such passion. Of course, Disney went on and David Attenborough, all these people, you know, anthropomorphism now is a, a zillion dollar business. The mainstay, yeah. Yeah, happy feet. Uh, and and uh, as long as you're not lying to the children, you know, as long as, as long as it's sort of true fantasy or based on our last set of uh, children's books was sort of based on uh, like the cassowary chick is trying to find blue fruit because that's what dad's looking for in the rainforest. So, you know, I mean, chicks don't go out and help their father find the blue fruit, but at least it's sort of, it's it's in the framework of, of, of telling that story. And that, I guess that's important to help uh, engender that connection so that there is um, yeah. the storytelling so vital to that. I'm still getting people send me manuscripts. I got one uh, yesterday about a penguin. You know, people are still wanting to... Uh, and, and by the way, children's books, if you want to publish books, we can talk about publishing if you like, because that's been my career. Yeah, absolutely. Um, um, uh, ch ch children's books have survived. I've got all the rights back now. I've got all the kids' books. I've got all the... I've got no idea what I'm going to do with them. What I was thinking, <laughs> do, thinking of doing was digitising and then giving them all away. Oh, Online. there's such a, a big market for ebooks and, and that kind of thing these yeah. days. Uh, how do you feel about that, by the way, Steve, in terms of digitizing, um, you know, physical print like that? Uh, oh, well, well I, my, my masterclass, which came out of giving one talk that there was someone from Griffith University at, they were a mental health counsellor. Griffith University was having trouble with mental health, uh, teachers and students. This is 20. 18, early 2018, and they said, would you put together a course? I thought, Jesus. And that was the first, that was the first. So all I did was get the keynotes out because I got, I got 16 million keynotes giving, I gave hundreds of talks at libraries and around Australia um, to anyone who listened. Uh, so I just, I turned it into a course and, uh, and based it on my own, my own journey, right? Uh, m making sure that um, it, it, it was presented in a way that people could identify it was their journey as well, you know, ripping ego out. Um, we can talk about e ego is a great subject that I love to talk about as well. Uh, managing that, which is something that uh, some people struggle with. Um, yeah, so, so it's always been the natural history, the story, the storytelling and the National Park thing came out of, out of a, actually came out of a dive at, at, with a friend of mine who was very, very connected in the science world uh, down at Byron Bay out at the Julian Rocks. I was going, after leaving Jervis Bay, which I used to refer to as my bay, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> because no one, no, no one ever dived in Jervis Bay when uh, I was there. I had it all to myself. Now you can't. That's you, yourself. Wow. A, friend, a friend of mine actually moved down there and they, she's sorry she did because 
over Christmas, you couldn't get into the parks. They'd close them. There's too many people. Oh God! But I, I had that. I had that whole that whole area there, and just focused on capturing the fish and the invertebrates with the encouragement of um, what I, people I call the invertebrate queens. Um, that's Isabel Bennett and Elizabeth Pope from the Australian Museum. But all these people have passed. But John Paxton, the fish man, hasn't. Uh, and they came to my house one day and they sat there and I put on, I was shooting Hasselblad medium format and I, I, I pin sharp photographs of these marine invertebrates. They didn't have, they didn't even have, a, some of them didn't have a class. They didn't have a genus. There's certainly many new species. Wow. And I put them up on the screen and these two middle-aged women literally orgasm. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> Not even joking. Oh, and it, and you know, and 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 talk about a guy that was sort of who felt who felt, um, you know, um, inferior due to lack of education, you know, the old mind story. My mother didn't love me, and I didn't have an ex- education. And you tell these stories to yourself over and over, and you whittle away on your confidence. So anyway. Um, did you ever have any species named after you, Steve? If you sort of no, 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 no. I had a, I had a diving friend, Neville Coleman did. It, it, it had no, that that side of it had no interest to me. Yeah, he's got he's got about 30, 35 Coleman eyes. Wow. Um, and he was he was much much more, more serious. I was more I was particularly interested in fish behaviour, uh, not so much pursuing the species. Uh, how, did, how did all these fish fit together? And there was a naturalist in um, most of this world, by the way, was, was, was dominated by a very small number of marine naturalists, not scientists. Scientists didn't go underwater. They didn't take pictures. Now they use high-definition video cameras. Mm. Uh, and, and the people I worked on had never seen their fish and invertebrates alive. Okay, think about that. Yeah. And Dr. John Paxton, the reason I got into the museum was I found out what he did. His PhD, the way to a scientist's heart is via his PhD. So if you want to team up with someone and you want to get access to the animals that they're working on, and this is how this is how David Attenborough survived. I and mean, this is you know so much of what he done he's done with his career. Bless him. I saw him the other day on you know a, a recent cat, a, a recent piece of what is he ninety something or other. And I just felt such love for the guy. Mm. Just phenomenal the, um, respect. And so, what you know, if he wanted to do the private life of a shrew, he'd find scientists that were doing work on shrews. And that's how, that's how I got a lot of my weird and wonderful creatures. Uh, you go out with the scientists that are, that are, that are doing this work at night. Uh, the animals are kind of used to them. They're still wild, still running around in the wild. Uh, they're not. They're not sort of in a cage, um, and, and that's how that's how you get access to them. But he did his he did his fish. I normally show the photo of this because it's sexy fish. Uh, a little fish called Glidopus gloria maris. I was so proud that I learned the Latin name. I tell you what, <laughs> they're they're great for password. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> I mean. Pl- Platycephalus bassinensis is a dusky flathead. And I, I, I could carry a thousand, but I can't remember the people's wow. names or, um, you know, I can't even remember my second wife's middle name. I mean, but I can remember the Latin names. <laughs> it's interesting, isn't it? Where your heart lies. <laughs> uh, but anyway, he, he did his PhD not on that fish. It's called a pineapple fish, a little round thing. It looks like a little pineapple and it flips, swims around. It's bathypelagic. In other words, it lives off the continental shelf. And I've been to the continental shelf. I went to the continental shelf and it's maybe submarine. And I, I just wanted to open the window and have a look <laughs> because <laughs> that shelf down there, it would be breathtaking, breathtaking. So I was really interested in diving and photographing deep water. I mean, I pushed it to 170 feet, mm. naughty. You've got three minutes, four minutes down there. And then you've got to start working your way back up the ledge. So in total, you might have seven minutes to do 12 shots at that sort of depth. But the deeper you go, compared with the barrier reef, it's the other way around. The deeper you go in temperate and Tasmania, whoa, the deeper you go, the deeper you go in temperate or cool temperate water, the more spectacular it is. 
the bigger the sponges, uh, more dense the schools of fishes. And it was orgasmic. You know, you drive your boat out there. Uh, I had a Labrador dog that used to watch the boat while I was underwater. You drop your anchor down, you go down the anchor rope, <clears throat> you tie the anchor off and then make sure you didn't lose the anchor more than, you know, three, metres, four metres so that you could then turn around and free it and then come back up again. And the biggest scare I had is I turned around once and the anchor was gone. Oh, Did you do um, much um, diving in Tasmania at all? Uh, I, I, only a limited amount. Only yeah. a limited Mariah Island, Bridport with the seals, you know, off the top end there. Uh, very, very, very simple. That was back when the kelp, uh, the kelp forest was sort of big deal. We had the... Oh. And, uh, no, South Australia. I, I focused on... Um, I focused on... Revisiting, um, in fact, I've got a piece in my Around Australia Guide where I've covered all the animal groups with tips. Uh, making friends with fish. Can you make friends with a fish? And I sort of point out to people, you know, don't underestimate fish. They're, they're far more intelligent. They're not just a slab of meat in the fish shop. It's what, why I can't, eat. I can't bring myself to eat them. Have you seen uh, an octopus teacher at all? Oh, yeah. one of the best films ever made. Yeah. <laughs> it's many times, many yeah. times. Yeah, that and Mr. Turner, the two and a half hour film on, on Turner's life, uh, I have on my uh, computer. I watch them often. Now, that, that, that's, a, that's a beautiful. In fact, the, the, the shot that took that film out of him having introduced his young family to the wonders of the ocean and a drone flew over the top. Yeah. And his son is paddling along, taking his friends. I mm. just went, oh. Yeah, it's a nice way to close it, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. It was beautiful. Yeah. What, a, what a, how do you close that? You know, passing on. So, you know, this, this, is, this is what I've tried to do with the course is, you know, collect this passion, drive it, and then pass it on, handball it on to others. And we call it you course. as well, Steve. Yeah. Huh? And with every one of your books, uh, I think you've really uh, carried that message on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's 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 it's, it's an interesting it's an interesting. Uh, anyway, I'm I'm going on. I don't know. I was um interested <laughs> um uh, in uh, there's a have you heard of NFTs at all? Is that something that that interests you, or is that sort of uh, a field that that a uh, you know you you not touch with the barge pole sort of thing. You have what, a, what is it? Sorry? They're non-fungible tokens. They're, uh, um, I yes. guess it's a way of selling your work digitally. Oh, yeah, people have thrown that out. I've got people send me emails on that. You can make a million bucks. I'm being challenged at the moment. Uh, now, the Around Australia Guide, I've been sort of holding it until they open those bloody borders because it's, it's not a matter of reaching out to people. It's spending money to reach out to people. Mm. And then saying, oh, I'll come back to that when the borders are open. Boom. Yeah. So uh, getting, inside the, getting inside the hearts and minds of people digitally, I've been doing it physically all my life. I've been doing it digitally for 14 years, but now very intensely, you know, very, very intensely, um, and, and, and trying, to, trying, to, trying to bring that into being, not for fiscal gain so much, but for spiritual rewards, I'm a bit of a, you know, I'm a bit of a endorphin person. Mm. Well, that sort <laughs> I, of strikes I, me I, with I, NFTs because it does seem to be a very sort of capitalist sort of selling, just selling it to make money and, you know, how much of it is, is that, would you be able to create a connection or, or anything like that through, through a medium like that? Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, well, to, to me it's, um, I mean, I bought a phone when I was sick, when I was in the hospital. My first phone, it's one of those Pro Maxi things. And I'm still wrestling with that. Um, three months ago, it went blank on me and I lost everything. So oh. I had to put it all back in again. So I'm, I'm, I'm you know, I, I, I love doing my art and I love doing deep diving in my memory bank and my creative writing into putting words with images that um, that form um, more than, you know, this is a picture with a Canon 
I have no interest in cameras, none. Um, when you when you're doing your editing, um, how do you is is it just a complete exploration through your archives? So say you sat down and, and you want to do some mm-hmm. you know exploration. Do you have a, a purpose or you know? I wanna... Yeah, no, it's a, there's a purpose. I've got I've got a, I've got. If you like, I've got in in this new site that, that I'm working on at the moment, which is just good fun. I mean, nothing may have happen about it. There's one one portfolio called Art at My Feet. Now, people are going to go, holy shit, click, what's out of my feet about? So I'm, I'm, inter- I'm interested in getting inside the mind of people now, this is where I am now as an old man, <laughs> when they click on things, what are they thinking? What are they feeling? Where do they expect out at my feet to go? And, uh, of course, out at my feet is um, something I picked up from what is art all about when he talked about taking picture frames and his art students, he's a great art teacher, he'd take this, you know, 20 picture frames into the forest and he'd just go around and throw them down onto the leaf litter and fruits and things and he'd say to the students, now get your pad out in your little, your little comfy chair and I want to see a masterpiece come out of that picture frame. Mm. And I picked that up and I introduced it in the masterclasses if you can't think of what to photograph, try looking down. <laughs> yeah. And I'm a, I'm a meditative photographer. I love tripods. I love setting them up and waiting. I'm a waiting and watching person. Um, and while I'm waiting and watching, depending on where I am, I might leave the tripod, to, you know, if it's this is people there, you don't go too far away. <laughs> Uh, and and, uh, and just wander around and looking looking for elements, looking for elements that come together. So I've done a portfolio of that. I've also done one called The Art of Land, which which came out of the 2012, 2010 floods. Um, and a passion for John Olson's art. John Olson's career took a big turn. He's an artist, by the way. He's made millions. He's a highly recognised artist. He's now in his late 80s. I've met John. Amazing, amazing painting. And he flew over Lake Air as we are all now with our cameras getting excited about doing uh, Art of Land, our own interpretation. And um, he, 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 does, he does these big paintings and that, that had great influence on me. But I was there for the 2010 flood by Chico and and I went in to see, uh, went in to see the guy that owned, Trevor Wright that owns all the aeroplanes. And I said, Trevor, your website's bloody, you know, pretty ordinary. Yeah. Would you like a new set of pictures? Would you like a new set of pictures? I've tried that a few times. I tried it in Kakadu, and it, put, it came off too. Uh, and he said, Well, you pay the petrol. So I got three days airborne for three grand for the petrol, which included flying to uh, um, Southeast. Queensland to Birdsville and staying in the park. Oh, yeah. And we did early mornings, late afternoons, you know, the, the Gibber Plains. One of my very, very favourite pictures is, is ever taken is the artistry. There's no, I don't manipulate images that are already there. I see those images, what I would call contemporary. Uh, and, 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 it, and if the structure of those images, that the medium format has to blood, if they're, if, they're, if they're saying what I want to say, I won't touch them. But if I'm feeling like I want to say something more, then I'll go in and, and start using the tool. I'm only just starting to learn to use the tool. 14 years, it is not a walk in the park. Uh, and um, so try, trying to get these romanticism as a style, you, you can replicate romanticism, one of my favourites. So what I've done in the masterclass is shown people, you know, triptage, montage, collage, Romanticism, abstract realism, abstract, um, uh, abstract, abstractionism, which is a word, um, uh, all, the, all the way through. And then a link to the, what I call the global brain. So instead of looking at my stuff, they're going out and they're going, what is romanticism stroke photography? Not romanticism stroke art, romanticism photography. And you'd be amazed <laughs> what's going on out there. There's, there's some of the most spectacular art being developed digitally, globally. Um, I'd say that Australia is probably 20 years behind it. There's still this underlying 
need to control and restrict. Mm. And um, I haven't said this in the masterclass, and I don't know whether I should say it here. <laughs> it can be based on fear, fear of change. Um, you know, like Rick, your work, you know, the, the photoshopping, if indeed you do do use uh, that tool. Absolutely. Very gentle, very gentle, very gentle, very gentle. And you've kept within your the ethos as a minim, minimalist, which is a style. So I'm interested in styles and I'm interested in human expression. And I'm interested how different, I'm really, really interested in what motivates some people to express in uh, ways that are different. So I, I, I tend to mix more with physical artists. You know, you go to the studio and they're covered in paint. And I mean, the palette, the palette board with all the runny, caked on paint is a work of art in its own right. So, so yeah, so the art of land is, is, is aerial gibber, uh, aerial um, lake air, aerial um, torrens, lake torrens. Lake torrens is quite different to lake air. Yeah, and the one, that, the one that very few people go to is Lake Frome. Frome, yeah. Uh, lake Frome's got islands, which are gorgeous. And in the late afternoon, you get this phenomenal mauve textural background mm. and you get these glowing orange islands with which you can artistically position. Um, that, 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 that sort of stuff. But what, what I, what I, and also the mud at King's, King Sound is another area, but I don't sort of, I, I, I sort of pursue a, a category um, like feathers that fly is another category, which is mainly about the feathers. Uh, and and so I've been, I've been sort of immersing myself in this, feeling occasionally guilty because um, it doesn't pay the bills. But boy, does it give you pleasure? Well, there's and always so, a bit I'll, of a balance there, isn't there, Steve, in terms of um, <laughs> working that one out? <laughs> I've got my two screens and I put up over here, I put up the music. And Jesus, there's some fantastic stuff out there. And different, I mean, I, I built, I started doing digital art with Leonard Cohen exclusively. Um, he's now passed. And I'm in a, I'm in a different headspace <laughs> than I was. No, I don't know whether you know Leonard Cohen, but he sort of, you know, cut your wrist sort of stuff. Yeah. <laughs> We're talking about um, um, location. Oh, there's some young people now. Uh, we we're talking about no. locations just before Steve, and I, I was sorry to change topic there, but um, yeah, no, I was no. just wondering um, if you've got like um, an all time favorite place that you've photographed, or, or one place that you know just has a very deep connection with you, and and um, sort of if you were to think back um, and dream about a place that would be the place, yeah. Yeah, there are, there are places like when you go to the dentist and they're doing a root canal. <laughs> and you want to do it. <laughs> and, and you, you want to get the fuck out of try that technique. Um, <laughs> yeah, the, 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 I go back to experiences more than, yeah. I mean, the coral, coral sea, shallow water coral sea, um, I was invited three years ago. Um, to go up three, three different times by a man that owned 22 islands off the southeast coast of New Guinea. And he wanted to turn it into a sanctuary and he wanted to put a resort there. He already had a little resort, but the resort was for, for people that were helping invest in the conservation of the area. It's, it's, it's far enough away from New Guinea that the natives don't paddle out and steal everything. Uh, you'd, have to, you'd have to be intent. So I went up there and I took my middle daughter as a... Um, a dive guide and she fell in love with the, the dive master and he's the father of the kids on this block so it was kind of cool <laughs> that shelf there where you actually have the islands 22 islands and a vertical drop off all to yourself wow. that's kind of cool mm. um, and I'm also I also keep going back to I don't know that I'd want to go back now because it's probably been plundered the soft bottom sea life, soft bottoms are the, one of the richest, most diverse ecosystems on earth. Now that's mud, that's sand, that's detrital material, 
that's the centre of Jervis Bay. Jervis Bay now is entirely a national park. I was looking the other day wanting to write something about something and I hadn't realised that now the whole thing is national park. And we used to get, we, we I say we, I, myself and my dog, <laughs> used to go out in the middle of Jervis Bay uh, at night on a hot night and you drop the anchor and you go down and those soft bottoms are covered in sea stars. Panatiolacea, which is a big, which is a big uh, swaying uh, sea pen. It, look, it looks like a quill. Absolutely spectacular. Wow. Spectacular. Uh, sea pen. People can Google sea pen. Yeah. Um, and, and they'd all come up out of the sand, you know. It's a completely different. That's another place my head goes. Oh, I used to love it. And you get all these little shrimps and these little creatures and, oh, this, this orgasmic. And the other, the other place was the first time I went to Kakadu and it was all corrugated no one was there, at a place called Woolwonga Wildlife Sanctuary, which was the, the beginning of Kakadu, if you like. It was a, it was a, a nature reserve on the Nalangi Billabong Group. Now, you've got Nalangi Rock and you've got a river system there. It actually flows through to, to get to the floodplain. It goes through deep water Billabong. At, those, at that time, full of buffalo and very large crocodiles. Not as crocodile then as it is now. We used to ignore them anyway. Um, I, although I did, did get some scared when the water goes right at your feet. You know, and, the, and the nearest escape route is, well, forget it. Uh, yeah, being in a hide and photographing the birds there and then coming back um, many years later with a fellow called Les Gilbert to do natural sound recordings for a multi-screen, would you believe, multi-projector audio-visual inside the Kakadu Information Centre. Long gone. It's melted. I mean, it would all be digital. In fact, they did come to me wanting to rebuild it digitally, and when I gave them a quote, they ran away. Mm. Terrible. Big job. Huge job. So we had all this multi-screen, and we recorded the January, you know, then the knock them down season. We recorded them all from an audio point of view and using studio microphones. And the whole back of his old Land Rover was a recording studio. And that was another thing is, is that, that audio and then being, because the bird life in there was just staggering, staggering. I think it's the largest bird count, passerine bird count, excluding water birds, uh, in Australia in one place. That was around the rubbish dump in in Alangi Rock, and the houses there were uh, one ranger house, which they generously let us stay in, and the indigenous folk. So, so that was that was um, another special. But I, if people ask me that now, I say well, wherever I am. Yeah, well, that's a pretty good answer, isn't it? And it's a very mindful answer in terms of um, being present. Do you have a, a particular species or, or an animal, bird, or, or something like that that it gives you a well, little joy to photograph. The white pointed shark that was oh, yeah. nineteen. It's sort of gone. I had lips on the bum, but they wore off. <laughs> 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 and my first wife was a nursing sister. She said, "You know, when you're seventy six, which is what I am now, and you roll over to get a needle in your bum, and they see the kiss." And I remember my father seeing it while I was having a shower, and him thinking I'd become evil because he was very old school. You know, playing with the girls. With his lip, lip, lip on my bum, but yeah, I, I was smart enough to do it under the watch. No, the white, the white pointer, the white pointer um, sharks in general, um, a, a, a big, particularly that animal. It's it's just swims into your psyche, and the the bird would be, um, you know, they call it the black neck stork. It's got a purple neck, but anyway. Um, the the jabiru, mm. mm. it's an elegant bird, bird. and, yeah. and so colourful. Macrop- macrop- yeah, macropods it would be. Oh, I love them all. <laughs> I had a long, long affair with macropods. Um, I, I have I have a photograph of a very animal I fell in love with, which was a doughy eyed a doughy eyed uh, wallaroo, juvenile adolescent, and I saw them come down the cliff. I'd just been photographing for a book called The Grampians from Source to Sea for Rigby Publishers. And it included people and, you know, everything. I did a series for them. Uh, we did Wilderness Experience with Alan Fox. We did 
the Murray from Sewells to Sea. They were ugly books. Don't don't look them up. (laughs) (laughs) They were done by a journalist who didn't want to give me any room to put pictures in them. But, um, yeah, he, he, I've been photographing these people climb these at Mount Arapolis. Do you know Mount Arapolis? Oh, yeah, yep. Yeah. 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 Famous rock climbing. Yeah, so climbing there. Uh, and I was pretty impressed with these agile physical people. I'm not an agile, phys- I've never been an agile physical person. I'm a helicopter person, you know, or a flight <laughs> of the building. A helicopter person. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, I do admire people that aren't. Listen. Fantastic things people are doing now, you know, roaming the world and uh, and doing their thing. Um, I've forgotten where we were. Oh yeah, and and I, I went out to photograph feral goats. We wanted feral goats from the Gammon Ranges, which was plagued. So I, I, I tracked down the indigenous folk, and they took me out. You know, fifty million feral goats, and I went out on my own, and I was sitting there f- photographing. I've got the pictures. Billy goats, huge, beautiful billy goats. So it's, a, it's, a, it's a shame some of our ferals are, are such damage because some of them are kind of like foxes are a beautiful animal. Mm. And this wallaroo came down the cliff. I'd, photo, I, I'd, I'd already left national parks and I'd photographed macropods with them, but no soul connection. When you go out with a scientist or with other people, you don't necessarily get a soul connection. So I've done ninety percent of my travel alone, and I, I get I get really I get really lost. Anyway, this uh, wallaroo came down the cliff like it hadn't done it in its mother's pouch, and it knew exactly where to. These little protrusions coming off the cliff came right down in front of me. I've got the picture, landed right there, and these big because young wallaroos have got these big round doughy eyes, and they've got these lovely round ears. They're very pretty. They're the prettiest of all of the, they leave grey kangaroos for dead. And it went into my heart and I had, I fell deeply in love with all things macropod. <laughs> and that's how it happens. You, you, get, you start to pursue a group of animals. I just judged recently on World Kangaroo Day, uh, 980 entries into the Kangaroo Day competition. It's on, it's on YouTube. You can Google it. Oh, cool. And and uh, went through oh some fantastic pictures, fantastic pictures. So I, I'm enjoying that. I'm enjoying I enjoy other people's pictures. I, I really enjoy other people's creativity. Um, I get very emotional when I see fine acting. I love film. I love fine acting. Um, you know, Mr. Turner, Anthony Anthony Snow. He's, he's done he, he's done some fantastic film uh, in, 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 you know, with th- those sort of names on a film I pursue them so I love acting um, yeah so what else that's a creative pursuit I I had another question too Stephen that's um, looking at um, we mentioned earlier a bit about publishing and, and your background in that mm-hmm. and I, I don't know if there's too many other people in Australia that have um, made and, and distributed as many books as yourself Um and um, I, I guess there's a lot of um, photographers up and coming and, and more established that would love to uh, release their own books someday. Do you have any uh, advice for, for people that are looking to get into pub- self-publishing, I suppose, in that regard? Like, is it a good idea these days? And, and um, any, you know, tips on starting out? Yeah, well, there's, there's two things. I mean, the way Rick did it, uh, by creating a work that, you know, love and passion from the last X years, which I, I note that I was looking at one of your colleagues from the collective uh, website yesterday, one of your colleagues that I didn't know actually existed. I keep discovering people. And, and I know Tony Hewitt, whose work I, I absolutely adore. So, um, he, he's a master. Um, he does know what art is. <laughs> and, um, yeah, doing, doing those books, um, I've got... I've got one, I did it in Brazil. I, they did it as a gift for me. It was, it was called As One. It was about the digital art. I did an exhibition in Brazil. I toured for a month with an okay. with a Indigenous dance troupe talking to all the photographic groups over there. And I'll tell you what photography I did. <laughs> when they turn up, you know, there's 6,000 people in this huge hall that can't speak English. And you've got, you've got 90 minutes. <laughs> and the interpreter doesn't even come out and introduce themselves. 
I was just told to speak a little bit slower and not to use Aussie jingoism. And it went well. But the, the, if they get a laugh, because I like to put in a few images, it, if they get a laugh, it's sort of, it's got a lag. Like you'll, t you'll say it, they hear it, and then they process it, and then they laugh. <laughs> so it's like being on Zoom with your pictures coming up slowly. Yeah, that that was that was uh, that was a um, what was the question again? I was oh, more publishing. around just um, self publishing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I've got a lot to say about publishing. Oh, Jesus! <laughs> Naivety. I, I started I started publishing. Uh, my first book um, was Ocean of Life. It was printed by a blind millionaire who owned a printing company in Melbourne, who also owned Skin Diving in Australia magazine. His name was Ian McNeil. And he'd speak as a sighted man. Did you like your book, Steve? I really loved the cover. Until I met him, he'd never seen the cover, but his wife had described it to him. But I went and, had, I went and stood beside a one-colour printing press in 1970 in Melbourne. Chick-chung. Chick-chung. Black goes through, blue goes through, red goes through, yellow goes through, and the smell of the ink, the sound of the printing press, I just looked at it and said, welcome home. This, <laughs> this, this, is, this is just the whole, the whole event was like a better than sex, I've got to tell you. Don't, don't tell anyone. <laughs> <laughs> So that, anyway, that book came out, and I've still, I've still got a copy somewhere. Yeah, yeah, I'll show you. Yeah, please. It, uh, it was done with Electroset. I need to buy another copy. You, you can actually st still find it. You know, eBay, they resell all my books, which is kind of cool. Um, and, and, you know, the pictures, oh, it's, they're all, everything's printed dark. You know how it is, even with your calendars. I've got a calendar publisher, Brown Trout, that I've been training to, to print light and bright. I don't know if you can see it. There. Oh, yeah, that's absolutely. It. Yeah, that, that's the sort of stuff. And so all the headings were done with Letraset. Now, these are old school photos, you know, mm. old school. And but you, uh, were, um, you were really at the forefront, weren't you, in that, in that sort of sense of under... It was the first book on Marine Life published in Australia. Yeah. And I thought, I thought everybody would rush out and buy it. <laughs> <laughs> and I learned my first marketing lesson. Uh, you know, it's, it's, I mean, what Rick did, I, I believe it was 100, wasn't it, Rick? You know. Right. Yep. Yeah. And, and if it costs you a, fi a figure of money that, you you know, you're not going to die if you lose it. No. It's like buying four grand's worth of Bitcoin. I mean, what do you got to lose? Mm -hmm. You know, it's, when it first came up, my, math, my wife's a mathematician. I know nothing about Bitcoin. I have no interest in it. Never been a gambler. And she bought it for fun. Uh, and, and so, you know, can you afford to lose four grand? Sure. Can you afford to lose 40? So what, what I say to people about self-publishing, um, we, we start, I started with posters. I did everything wrong. The cylinders were too light. I didn't have a koala or kangaroo, a wombat or an echidna in the range, because I thought, they're too ordinary. I want a thorny devil and a mask gannet. <laughs> Nobody knows what a mask gannet is, or particularly a thorny devil. Uh, and I put it in and, and I asked the retailer why, that, why none of them sold in Easter. It was, God, Easter, I was shitting myself. I had a, where, I had a, a shed full of poster cylinders and bins, you know, you put the bin was brown. Um, and some of them are on my website. Uh, and, and anyway, um, so I, I learned, I, I very quickly published the koala and very quickly published a, uh, uh, a couple of kangaroos, and then the whole thing took off. And over two years, we sold 100,000 post pack posters. That was the beginning. You wouldn't sell a poster today in a pink fit, nobody wants a poster. And I then, I, the, the next project was, uh, I had this passion. I was, doing, I was doing contract publishing for zoos. I did, I did Hillsville Sanctuary. I did um, 
um, Taronga Zoo. I did Western Plains Zoo, and I did um, Karamban Sanctuary on the Gold Coast. So I'd organise the writing, I'd organise the designer, and that's called contract publishing. So that's something that people could reflect on and consider. In other words, creating a publication for a body. I've, I'm actually reconnecting as we speak with the guy that helped me get my head around mass marketing, mass merchandising, spinners, how the industry worked, because the calendar industry is a different, a different mathematical equation than the book industry. Calendars fit into what's called greetings and gifts. Greetings and gifts are cards, stationery, all of that sort of category. Um, and the margins are different. When, when you go to a retailer, the margins are different. When you talk to people selling books, it's a discount from retail. So if it's, if it's $20, it's a discount. You know, And if it's tourist market, they want 100% markup. So it's less 50. So getting my head around all this stuff. Anyway, in 1987, and, and this, this story is, is, to, is to point out to people that um, wh while it might be very challenging, it is possible. And I've seen, I've seen I mean, they nibbled at my heels. We were, we were in 3,600 accounts. I had 125 staff, mostly through the whole of the late 80s and through the 90s. Yeah, so, so, so uh, and, and we, 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 I don't like quoting numbers because it sounds like you're bragging, but many, many millions of dollars in revenue turnover and what I had to learn, and I learned it very quickly, uh, is that revenue coming in doesn't belong to you. <laughs> Net profit after tax belongs to you. And um, that was a lesson I learned because my accountant at the time introduced me to a fellow, uh, I can give his name, Clow Benfield, and he had a company called Australian Building Industries. It was corrugated iron. Now, I'm telling him the story for a reason. It was corrugated iron, and he came to my house with his henchman, big, fat German guy, 40 years old, multimillionaire, had a Learjet, stretch limo. Anyone with those sort of items, you know, you, these days I'd be going, Hello. <laughs> Be cautious. Uh, anyway, he came and I was pretty impressed. And he said, uh, if, he, he said, what would you do if, if you had the money? Because he knew, he knew how popular Australiana was going to become. No? It wasn't then, but how popular it could become. And I said, well, you know, it's cards, puzzles, you know. Be, 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 be. I said, but ultimately I want to do children's educational. And I want to do some serious books, um, you know, uh, which, which I have done, um, you know, like the uh, Natural History of Australian Ecosystems with Alan Fox, which we brought out with the ABC, you know, really valued books that would sort of tag along on the back, on the back that you don't necessarily make that much of a net profit from, you know, net, net profit after all costs. And, of course, you know, once you start bringing in your own costs, <laughs> my wife says, you know, you don't put anything in there for the development work. I said, well, you know, if I put that in, <laughs> you have, have to sell it for $9,000. So, so um, anyway, he, he actually lent me, and the reason he did, that this is more important, he lent me half a million, interest-free, to be repaid when it's possible to be repaid. I was naive. I had nothing. I was coming off the back of all these zoo books. I owned my own house. It was a $128,000 house I'd built after leaving the Navy. It was in Paddington. It sold, by the way, six months ago for $2.1 million. <laughs> <laughs> That's a long time ago. I'm talking 70. Yeah. Any, anyway, I, 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 um, what he said was, I am very keen to get into the tourist business and I want to create a range of Australiana foods and I want to have roadside cafes built in the, in some quirk, quaint way, corrugated iron roof, you know, la la la. And so he went, he went off on that pathway and gave me full support. It was a 50 50 partnership. And that was July the 15th, 1987, I remember, because I was my birthday on the July the 15th, 1987, just happened to be. 
And then we ran into 1987, uh, late 1987, October. I don't know whether you guys or well, you wouldn't remember, but people around you may. And that was the, the big cr crash, the financial crash. Yeah. And the accountant, two weeks after it happened, I didn't even know it had happened, came to me and said, you really need to seriously have a conversation with Clow over Christmas. This is six, this is six months into our partnership. Yeah. So we sat down. What I'm telling you is, is, is the most important thing I've ever done in my life. Because we did it with a scrap of paper, a handshake. And we sat down in January in a cafe and he was a very well-dressed man and he had a $1,000 Parker pen. He <laughs> pulled it out. He grabbed a napkin. And whether the numbers were correct or not correct, he scratched out what he'd spent uh, on helping develop the company. He provided facilities. He even pr provided the accountant, who, by the way, stayed with me for decades. Uh, good people. Uh, I was hiring friends. I wasn't hiring, you know, sales rep. I like you, so I'm going to going to hire you. What I learned over the years: if you haven't pounded the pavement and been to shopping centres and had a million lock knockbacks, and were preferably a non-smoker and preferably you know, oozed um, reliability and honour because I needed people that could be trusted. And we built the whole ethos. Oh, we, we shook hands that I owed him 300 grand. So we gave him 150 out of cash flow because the company, when the company started, it went like this. Mm, must have, yeah. Every, every account wanted the stock in. We were only doing Brisbane at the time. We went to Sydney uh, after that. And it was all nature. I wasn't going to do urban stuff at that point. Little, little, little did I know, um, you, will, you will not succeed in that market if you're going to be pure. Um, I think I was talking to you, Luke, about yes. you go to Lake Dove, photograph Lake Dove. This is where we walked around Lake Dove. There's the picture. There's the poster. There's the card. Or Peter Dombrowski, who we all know and love and adore his pictures. We want to go up. We want to get in an aeroplane and shoot five four uh, cradle mountain backlit from behind, and you know no one sees it, no one relates to it. I had to learn that because I didn't want to really go down that path uh, and, and initially because my career before that was wilderness pure, and if they didn't like that, then. But once you get once you get into going, so anyway, I, I gave him his money, he disappeared. And I said, contact me mid-October that year, which was 1988, uh, after the uh, World Trade Fair, which was World Expo, which went brilliantly for us. That was no one else too, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, no one else. No one else had. A, we had. I had. A, I had that photographic Australia book. I had little gift books with my poetry in it, and we had cards and we had posters. And we had a you know a wall stand. I, he rang me up and I sent him a check. He, sorry, he contacted me and gave me his address. I sent him a check and he rang me up blubbering like a baby. <laughs> he, said, he said, of all the people, you said, you know, you're the only person I've ever partnered with and you're the only person that's actually kept their word. And I, I never forgot that. I mean, I wouldn't, wouldn't have done anything if it hadn't been for class. Because you need it, you need a kick if you're going to start something with sales reps, and you know. So that's how it started, and it, it just it just grew and grew and grew. I had 19 sales reps, 19 cards, cars. I had um, uh, a pre press. We were doing all our own pre press for print. Um, I, I remember. I remember '95. My pre press was costing me 1.2 million. That gross turnover was fifteen million per annum, and you scramble down to the bottom and try and find a dollar for yourself. <laughs> 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 and that's what that's what uh, I became obsessed. And we took on Tony O'Connor relaxation music naively again, uh, and we put it out into the marketplace. And um, I don't like quoting numbers, but many millions of dollars worth of relaxation music CD was sold. And I reinvested that in children's publishing. 
and we brought out amazing facts about Australia educational range in 95 and a half. And we brought it out in July for a November launch and pre-sold 1.2 million in spinners right through the post offices, um, right through Angus and Robbins and Bookworld when they finally banned spinners, kept um, that range. That range has been updated three times. I've now got all the files and it's closed. So I'm, I'm in, in a situation at the moment do you, do you bring it back? Do you do it again? Do you move on? Uh, and what I would say to people is you first got to ask yourself, and you can't, you can't give advice. You can't, you can't give advice because people's life situations are vastly different. They might have access to funds. They might be retired. They might, may not need to be concerned. I mean, it all, it all depends. But what I said to a dear friend in Tasmania that was going to launch calendars and cards, and by the way, she's a stunning photographer. She's ex Sunshine Coast. I said, ask yourself, how many accounts? Who's going to approach them? Who's going to do the invoicing? Who's going to collect the debt? Where are you going to put the stock? Who's going to deliver the stock? Who's going to deliver the bad? Who's going to collect the bad debt? And you will find very, very rapidly, unless you've got rapid growth and someone else to do these things, that you will considerably miss your time with the platypus, your time with the waterfalls, your time. And I was, I was fortunate that I grew quick enough to be able to escape. I was away six months, nine months, three months. So we, we grew quick enough with the... The, the window of no one nibbling away, you know, then you get Peter Lick with his postcards and so-and-so with this and so-and-so. I'm not criticising them, but that's just, that's just the way the world works. Mm. You bring something else in its scene to work. <coughs> and, and um, you know, but if you've got something to say and you've got something worthwhile and that's what that masterclass is about, develop, do any... It, do some inner engineering. Who are you? Work on yourself. You have something you can say. Can you stand up in front of people and talk about something other than my photography? Because at the end, um, they want to know sincerity. They want to know truth. They want to see your raw emotion. They want to see a window into who you are. So if you haven't got that, it's it it's it. it it can happen, but it's it, it's a struggle. But I remember when the market was full, we couldn't get it any fuller. In, 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 in the mid to late 90s and into the 2000s, chock-a-block. You know, the post office um, account manager would be buying this person's cards. Now, why do you need six postcards then? That means nobody makes any profit. So there's all this sort of stuff going on. Who's servicing, who's et cetera. Um, but there were some people, there was, a, there was a guy on the Great Ocean Road that did everything in black and white. He did it medium format. He ran classes in black and white photography. Stuff was brilliant. Large format calendar, he just did the one. Every retailer supported him. He did what Stephen Nowakowski does from North Queensland. You can look at his calendar. Spiral Band, he's a dear friend of mine. He's a conservation photographer working with people in North Queensland. Um, <laughs> trying to buy as much of the daintry before they completely ruin it. Um, he does a range of calendars and he's done it exceptionally well. We talk often, share stuff. And he, um, he sells it. He collects the debt. Um, his partner now does the design. He used to buy the design. He organises the printing offshore. And he is living off some drone contract work other bits and pieces, and of course, supporting his designer partner uh, on some projects, I'm sure. Uh, but he, he he is keeping that alive, and I keep saying to him, don't overprint, don't overprint, don't overprint. And I've got a very good relationship with Brown Trout and uh, helping them navigate a treacherous road on print runs, and particularly with COVID. And so what brought us undone was we couldn't 
the, the Pascal Press, who are largely digital now, they have Reading Eggs. They're a multi-million dollar international company. Um, they no, they're no longer selling physical product. You know, having reps on the road, you know, retailers disappearing every five minutes. Because what brought us undone was not just the flood and the lack of insurance, was Borders, Angus and Robinson and um, the Calendar Club, all owned by a company in New Zealand called Reds. Um, they had a bad year and just ran up the flag and said, we're bankrupt. Mm. And so I got hit with the lack of insurance and the whole of the Christmas stock that went out there, we didn't get a red cent. Oh. So tens of thousands of dollars and then, and then, you, and then you get the, the fall over. So the thing is to be able to take your passion for what it is that you want to create and physically make and put in a shop and just shift it over there. Keep it, nurture it, love it, you know, mock it up. Don't seek too much advice unless the people you seek the advice from have that definite skill. If they don't, if they've never done it and they don't understand the industry, don't seek advice. It's like asking people, well, what do you think of my beautiful tree art piece? They're not even a photographer. They're not, they're not an artist. So why are you asking them? And I, I, as I've gotten older, I, I realise how potent it is to be your own art director, your own life decision maker. You call the shots. If you fuck it up, hug yourself, reinvent, get back to it. I mean, in your situation, young lads, you know, young people, similar ages, you're all on a similar... That, that can be fantastic. That, that can be collaborative... I did, a, I did a newsletter the, uh, 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 in November on collaboration. Collaboration is very, very, very wonderful. You know, collaborate with musicians, collaborate with, you know, whoever. <coughs> um, that's a different kind of a situation. But uh, I, I, would, I, would, I would say if you're trying to build, build it as an industry that will sustain you and your partner, I did the product. We had post-production. I had three editors, two full-time authors four designers, all these people. It was, the only, um, it was the only publishing company in Australia that was fully self-sustainable, had everything other than a shop and a printing press. And we tried to offset the distribution on several occasions, but nobody else would give me Kanamala or, 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 or the roadhouse at, uh, you know, um, in the middle of nowhere, because some of those roadhouses, you know, you couldn't keep the stock up. You'd be just trucking stuff out there. The bus would stop, empty the stand, fill it up again. You know, it was it was it was quite remarkable. You mentioned Steve about um, uh, you you didn't have the printing press. Um, I'm interested in your view about um, getting it printed locally in Australia versus obviously um, it tends to be more economical to print in China. Um, you know, is it is it worth still trying to pursue printing locally just to support locals, or is it the their economy problem there? Well, the, the, for us, I kept it in Australia. I kept it in Brisbane. I supported two printing companies until economy of scale. Just we, we just couldn't do it. I mean, the print bill for doing the print run that we needed. I mean, the fax books were selling ten thousand a month. So you know, all of a sudden, you, you know, you, you've you've got what twelve titles. You got these huge bills, print bills coming in, uh, and it was hundred percent dearer than Asia. Wow! And and uh, w- you know the, the the other thing we were able to do was apart from one company in all of those years who was a wire stand manufacturer, I never ever signed a letter of credit. And when I went bankrupt, they all got paid. Wow! Including the bank. That's an interesting journey to bankruptcy. Mm. And I'm, I'm also um, interested as well in terms of um, you're, you're a massive advocate for the mental health space and, and um, mm. no doubt you've, as you've just been recalling, gone through some awful times in your own life um, and using your work to also um, help in, in that space. And, and um, can you tell us a bit about that? <laughs> That's a can of worms. Uh, <laughs> yeah, well... Um, most mental health issues, many men- mental health issues stem from childhood trauma. 
So, yeah, I was um, spiritually and physically abused. And um, the older you get, the more emotional you get about this stuff. I mean, you know, it wasn't that long ago I could talk about it without getting emotional. So what the hell? Who, who cares? Um, and I was very severely bullied at school. That's why I left school. Um, in those days, it was a cane, face-slapping, um, parish the church rack, cross-eyed, big ears, glasses, curly hair. <laughs> Uh, f fearful of going into the streets because there was a lot of, in those days, they called them bodgies and widgies. Um, and all I wanted to do was get out of Dodge. I didn't want to go to school. So I started as a jackaroo on Kangaroo Island as a young boy and hated it. Uh, I, di I didn't hate the work, uh, rounding up sheep. I loved the dog, Kangaroo Island, <laughs> beautiful place. But the people were, were worse versions than my mother and father. They were very strict. I mean, I've learned to be able to see things in perspective now because when you wake up to the fact that you, um, you know, at 66 are feeling anxiety, you're feeling stress, you're going into depression, uh, suicidal thoughts, with, with all of this stuff um, tumbling over you and working in the space that I do, I hear a lot of it. I work with Mental Illness Fellowship. We actually have a photographic competition uh, every year. The most amazing entries last year. Hundreds of them all over the world. It took me three days to judge it. Oh, there was three judges. Um, and, you know, some of the images are just very, very, very powerful. So I'm, talk I'm, talking, about, I'm talking about an area of mental health that I've focused on, which is mind story related, the want of better language. So what I did when I decided to take uh, my work and my experience um, of loss and the anxiety attached to that, I'm talking about crippling, gut-slamming anxiety. Um, and the only teacher that I reached out for was Eckhart Tolle's Power of Now, This New Earth. I connect with many now, but he had a quote, uh, you can lose something you have, but you can't lose something you are. Have a think. Mm. And one of the problems that we have is that we don't invest, particularly we creatives, we don't invest, in, and this is where the creativity comes from. Absolutely. Absolutely. Guaranteed, it comes from pain, loss, recovery, um, and, and, and when, when I had to hand over the key, <laughs> uh, you lost the library, lost the cameras, lost the car, lost the $2.5 million house. It was quite a house, I've got to tell you. Trees growing up through the middle of it, and it was a gorgeous house. Um, and interestingly, I had a short head pointer that always pre-warned me when I was going to have an episode. <laughs> he'd come up, he, he, he knew. <clears throat> and and um, <clears throat> anxiety is, is is because I've had a heart attack, anxiety, riveting anxiety, is no different to a heart attack. It's exactly the same symptom. Mm. Uh, I had one at, uh, <laughs> I had one, I had one in the wilderness in uh, the top end once. And I was in quicksand. I went down to my crutch and I had a video camera and I was narrating into the video camera what was happening. Still got the tapes oh. on. Yeah, interesting little journey, that one. <laughs> I had another one at I had another one at Wilson's Promontory on the beach. Beautiful reflections, gorgeous. I was on my own. I used to travel around, you know, all over the place on my own. And I, I was down there in the beautiful golden sands and I, I just fell over, I just collapsed. I thought I, was, I thought I'd had a heart attack. And uh, it, in, in, in all of these cases, there was a diagnosis of anxiety, anxiety attack. I've got to know some fantastic surgeons. 
uh, cancer specialists, people I've had lovely conversations with about what our mind can do to our body, you know, cripple. And alternatively, what your, uh, what your mind can do for your creativity. So you can, you, can, you can actually flip that and use that as a really powerful driving force. But I don't think it can be done without some investment in, in you know, Sad Guru, who's a spirit, global spiritual teacher from India, uh, has a program called Inner Engineering. And I love the term, whether you do the course or not, it's relevant. Yeah. Inner Engineering, in other words, you're going to do work on your inner self. And that's where your creativity lives, inside you. you when you feel you're up there on the, in, in, you know, where you guys are going out getting blessed, <laughs> most people can only dream about it. You're up there in the high country. The thoughts that come into your mind, the words that come out of your mouth. Uh, my wife keeps telling me, counselling or cautioning me about what comes out of here. And, of course, this pain concept, this, this is massive business. Um, most of YouTube, depending on who you click onto, you know, the Murdoch empire has been built on pain, other people's pain. And the reason it works so well is people become addicted to it. I want more bad news about Donald Trump. I want to know when he's going to go to prison. I want to know, you know, so that you get into this cycle and it can happen to anyone regardless of who they are. Um, and and, and um, so th this, this idea of pain and what I've come to realise is that, you know, there's the, the vertical, if you like, the, my mother's little cross. There's the past and the future. We spend so much time lamenting, uh, you know, the, the childhood trauma coming through and then we're projecting, oh, what about next year? What about my health? What about my income? What am I going to do? How am I going to sustain... Gee, I'm, you know, so and so is doing better than me, and what I'm, all these stories, all this stuff that goes on. And so I started, I started having conversations with mental illness fellowship openly in forums in their offices, and at the table there were people that were specialists in serious things like schizophrenia. And they, and I said, if I'm going to go public and talk about this stuff on the radio and get interviewed. And talk about it. I go around, you know. I don't always raise these. It depends on the audience. Um, but my my stories are something people relate to very quickly, and they realise that um, what's holding them back is the stories they're actually telling themselves, which get told and retold and tweaked and coloured, <laughs> and you know, absolutely exaggerated from time to time. A little bit of colour here, a little bit of colour there. Instead of just celebrating the day, and and particularly for people like us that have, if you, if you want an obligation, you you reach out and help people heal their inner self. Nature, nature connection just just flows, and I figured that if people could um, just simply accept that they're intrinsically part of nature, to embrace that they're entire physicality, whether they're into this faith or that faith, is totally irrelevant. None of the spiritual teachers that I've ever um, connected with or look, you know, listened to the material ever mention God and church. And it, it's not about Christian faith. And I could see that my mother, uh, you know, this, this lack of relationship, which I never had, was connected to her own childhood trauma, her own journey looking for love. She married a man that was old school Elizabethan. He didn't know how to express emotion. I don't know how old your fathers are, but, you know, people, people from the, the 40s and 50s that are still alive really struggle in this space because that's not necessarily who we are. Yeah. And, and so, so, yeah, so, so um, that, that's, that's where it is for me, more growth in that space and... Uh, so I, I started developing metaphors, um, you know, the determined wombat. So I started talking about determination. So module one in my masterclass uh, under, under, under the section of um, um, dealing with adversity deals with metaphors. 
uh, from nature, you know, the patience of an egret, um, you know, the, the, the passion for life of a butterfly that lives for nine days. Back to your anthropomorphism, moment. Steve. From the, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, that's that's that, that's not a, that's pure natural history. Yeah. Yeah. The birds wing, bird wing butterfly lasts for ten days, and if it doesn't celebrate and flutter and attract a mate and feed and rest and do all that, you don't have a bird wing butterfly. So uh, we humans have got to be prepared to step outside the comfort zone, stepping outside the comfort zone, and taking a risk to fulfil what is deep in your heart that you know you must do with your life is all that life should really be about. Wow. Mm. That's, my, that's my take on it. Absolutely. Follow, follow. What am I going to do? What am I going to do? Follow that. That's really, um, really inspiring, Steve. Um, thank you so much for sharing. We haven't mentioned, haven't, haven't mentioned cameras and things. Ah, that's no. good. Some things transcend that really, don't they? I mean, yeah. that's one thing on our show, we do tend to go into that so much. So it's um, definitely a, a, a beautiful, um, uh, refreshing change to, to have um, more of the philosophical discussion and, and, you know, what really drives us and what makes us do what we do and um, and create that purpose in our life. And right. you've got a whole um, masterclass available for people that pretty much takes them through just that and, and developing that process. Do you want to talk a little bit about your masterclass? class just as we sort of yeah um, yeah. I, yeah i probably would like to just um bring up one bring up one page okay so that that yeah, um, yep. brilliant so this this is this is modeled on a journey and you know i welcome i welcome feedback and debate i, I get lots of feedback <laughs> most of the feedback is you know i came wanting to learn about how you take pictures but Goodness me, I've been in it for three, and I'm still on module one. <laughs> so hey, that's a big one, though. Yeah. So, so what what I've done, and and uh, what I've done is I've, I've I've started with the creative life purpose, which defines that sentence and how participants and people on the journey can possibly consider their own purpose, and at the end of that particular module, in fact, Rick's got a page in there. Uh, I've, I've asked 12 photographers that have been on that journey um, to, to share, you know, four to six images, two paragraphs and a statement about what drives them. And you all know and respect Rick, he's, he's got yeah. that. Uh, we, then look at, we, then, we then look at the concept of um, uh, refurbishing, you know, um, Poetry, reading, time in nature, stillness, solitude, meditation, whatever it is that brings nourishment. Which is it, yeah. Right. And then you run into the brick wall, you know, um, the, all the fears. And it's, 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 it's all about fear and love. There's only two words. So every, everything's based on fear. So that, de that deals with that right up, right up front. And I give some examples and I use images as metaphors. Projects with purpose, really, that's the glue that holds it all together. Um, I'm, I'm actually counselling some women at the moment independently, and they're, they're, all, they're all quite advanced, but they've got lots of pictures, they've got lots of images, but they're now deeply considering where they can bring their own life story and their clearer vision of community um, in, into this concept of projects. So the projects, um, I've even invited somebody to come in and, you know, children photography. You know, it, it could be any project. But if it wasn't for projects pursuing, uh, I, I would have never uh, never done anything. So we look, we look at managing them, uh, hosting, where you host them, how you re-access them. And, of course, it's, you know, it's keywords. The Art of Seeing Art, which is the, the bliss, this is what you guys... Most of the time you're in the wilderness, you're going through the process of seeing art. You're not taking the picture. You're looking for something that's triggering. So it's about weather, seasonality, um, and all of the design principles and, the, the, you know, all of 
a colour form texture, um, about clouds, about the, the marriage of all that. So seeing art uh, becomes intuitive. And when you drill, I've done actually physical workshops with real beginners where we've walked through South Brisbane, through the concrete jungle of South Brisbane, uh, with lots of noise and heat and concrete and, you know, finding, and, and at the end of it, we go and have a, it's a whole day. And in the evening, we go and have a meal together. And m many people come up and say, I'm never going to see the world the same way. Because mm. there is art everywhere. What a compliment. Wow. Yeah. So cameras and capture, I, I have to give credit to my dear friend, Dean Holland. He gets reference in there. He's the mobile phone whiz kid, whiz kid who's a brilliant reinventor. He has a PhD in methods of teaching. And we came together about eight years ago. In fact, I met him and I knew within 10 minutes we were going to be lifelong connected. <laughs> He's a remarkable person. He's taught all over the world in Asia, in, 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 in the Amazon, uh, teaching teachers how to teach. And he really went up me. He really, he really inspired me to see better the levels and using the language. So we've actually, I've, I've written it and built it. He's, he's contributed through writing the section on camera, camera, uh, mobile camera, but he's reviewed what I've written. And what we've done together is we've looked at sharp and soft, light and dark, and colour management whether it's black and white or what it is. Yeah. So there's five elements. So sharpness and softness and darkness and lightness. And that is all there is about. Once you learn how to control that, see it, uh, and you guys are all very experienced in post-production. Uh, and then the digital dark room, which, which, which is designed to break down the barrier of, uh, yes, there's, 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 um, uh, I, 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 I talk in cameras and capture about global adjustment through camera settings quite briefly. Uh, but the digital darkroom uh, is, is really about playfulness all the way through for writing for art, art on walls, you know, every which way with lots of different styles and also connecting for the only time in the whole masterclass to the global brain so people can see, hey, this isn't about, this isn't about what Steve Parrish does at all. This is, a, this, is a, this is about what the globe is doing and seeing, and I've, I've, been, I've been locked away. And I encourage people not to do, dig too deep into that, <clears throat> to, to look at it and feel stimulated. And I've got a couple of people doing, doing advanced digital art, for want of a better term, I don't like the term digital art, fine art, um, now that, that, that are, you know, and I encourage them not to be, not to necessarily go public until they really feel like they're expressing. It's, it's taken me a long time. So your creative life purpose is to discover your voice. Your life's work is to develop it. Your life's meaning is to communicate it. So connecting with community, which looks at public speaking, social the fear of going public, because there's a whole string of new fears that come up, you know, branding, the internet, <laughs> people are going to steal me, you know, uh, all, all of this stuff that comes up. A lot of people are so terrified. And so people say, um, aren't you concerned about people stealing and cropping off your watermark? No, not even remotely. Stealing what? Stealing an expression that I've had from wherever and doing what with it? What are they going to do with it? You know, it's a tiny file, but it's big and it's on the screen and it's in your face. I've had 14 years on social media, many accounts, and I've had one or two instances, tiny, nothing. So connecting with community, identifying who the community is, overcoming your fear of reaching out, you know, the mind saying, oh, it's too hard. <laughs> back, paper travel, back in the old days, maps and uh, all of that sort of stuff. Um, and I'm talking there about the opportunity age where you can bring out paper products, and, and so that's the travel guide. Okay, so what, what, I've, what I've wanted to do uh, 
And, and it's worth saying this, if you're going to do an exhibition, if you're going to do uh, a beautiful book like Rick, Rick did, um, and asking yourself, what is my purpose and what do I want to achieve? What is it in a sentence, in one line, what do I want to achieve? And what I've got here is see it, hear it, feel it. And when you watch the video uh, and you get into the first volume, Capturing the Essence, I want people to slow down, find the essence and capture it, not get out of the bus with their mobile phone and walk to the end of the gorge and go clickety-click and then all the way back be talking about what you're going to do tonight or how hot it is, just encouraging the people. So what I, what I did is I created in my mind's eye who, I, who did I want to buy this and I want artists, um, you know, what are, they, what are they called, the grey nomads? I've forgotten. <laughs> Families with children. I, everybody can use. I wanted something that everybody can use. Everybody can use. Mm. So I, I, des, I designed it around primary dirt roads and um, bitumen roads and only going to, if you like, inverted commas, safe places. Right, not 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 you know not going over the Simpson Desert in a, in a car that's not designed to go over it, yeah. and you don't need to say that because people, those sort of people probably wouldn't buy this anyway. But what I wanted people to do was to slow down and feel. That's what I've got in the little video over the top. Uh, I want I wanted people I wanted people to slow down and invest in a little bit of knowledge about the subject, and I've I've used Simpson's Gap as an example. A little bit of knowledge, a little bit of social history, a little bit of Indigenous history, a little bit of geological history. You can pick that up on Wikipedia the night before you go. Piece of cake. So you take that knowledge out and you arrive before any light or preferably very, very soft light is starting to fill. And if you're with a group, and this was with a group, um, I, I don't want you to talk to each other. I don't want you to connect with each other. And we're going to be here for three hours and I don't... You know, I want you to be entirely on your own and I want you to hear it, see it, feel it. So mm. lie down in the cold sand and, and listen. What, what are you hearing? Try and identify. In this case, it was zebra finches and, a, <laughs> you know, a few other, the thump of a wallaby, et cetera. Uh, and then express it. And then so you, you're then stepping back with the knowledge Um and you're now looking at expressing, so wide angle, low angle, you know, short focus, however it is that you want to express the emotion that you felt. And once you've done that once, you'll never not want to do it again. Yeah. And so your $95 investment, and it's nine ebooks and 13 videos, the videos take people over the map, and I add heaps. You know, Tasm Tasmania was interesting. You know, I don't I don't take people wilderness walking, but what I do do is I introduce them to the best um, that I can find anyway, the best uh, digital guides that will help them. And Tassie National Park's got a, got some pretty nice stuff. Oh, and and try that. try yes. and stick stick with websites that are established and long with longevity and not going to disappear you know, six months after I brought it out. So a lot of national parks. So on the landing page of each contents page, you've got direct connection to the map of the state. Uh, and then I run the cursor over the state. I think we're going to have to draw our time to a close, unfortunately, Steve, yeah. um, um, just to keep time to our normal episode length. From, That's um, three from hours. That's three hours. It's been a while, so but we, we've been. It's been an absolutely thoroughly uh, enjoyable and inspiring conversation, and it's certainly really? a real honour to have someone like yourself join us. Um, I, I'm very glad. I got into photography, or you know, as a my passion for photography really did come from looking through your books many, 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 many years ago, um, yeah. and wondering and thinking, wow, I'd just really love to be able to take photos like that one day. And, and so to have you and be able to speak with you and hear your um, 
background and insights. Um, and I'm sure um, I think Rick was is the same in terms of his upbringing too. Um, and the Tony Connor was always playing at Christmas <laughs> as well. So um, yeah, so definitely um, uh, a real honor to have you and uh, on on the show. Um, and do check out Steve's masterclass and his Round Australia guide as well. Um, brilliant things put together. Steve Parrish, Nature Connect. Yep, Steve Parrish, Nature Connect. Look it up. Um, and we'll also have all of those links in the YouTube uh, video description as well. Um, anything final you'd like to say to everyone, Steve, um, or like a, you know, what's your sort of um, main piece of advice that you would provide um, up and coming photographers, do you think? Don't feel, yeah, what I, what I, it's, not, it's not about, I talk, I talk a lot about mind stories and thinking depressive thoughts and going off into that space. You know, I've been around forever and I still go there. <laughs> but I know I'm going there. This is what I want to close with. Uh, when you feel your mind overthinking and you feel yourself drifting into a space that is not in, in, inducive to your spiritual well-being, just simply acknowledge that's where you're drifting to. Ah, I'm drifting there. Yeah. Like my partner and I will get together and she'll, she'll say, you know, the great trust between us, she'll say, I'm not in a good space at the moment, but I'm pulling out of it. If she feels she needs to share the content of that space. But if you're in loving relationships, sometimes just constantly sharing, I'm in this space, being responsible. And she's helped me do this. Be responsible for your own space and acknowledge it. And uh, I would leave people with this as a visual picture. Imagine yourself sitting in a theatre all the seats are empty. You're sitting in the middle. There's a stage and there's a big velvet curtain. It's parted and you're on the stage doing a poor little me performance. <laughs> you know, there you are talking to yourself. Poor little me performance. Uh, my mother didn't love me. I didn't get an education. I got sacked. I don't like the boss at work. I really feel my relationship's falling apart. You know, la, 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 or whatever. whatever. These things, well, I don't, I don't want to trivialise it because these things can be pretty potent um, at the time. Just reach out and close the curtain. So when you wake up at one and two in the morning and you feel that, oh, <laughs> stand up, stick your head under the tap. Just be aware of it. Don't punish yourself for revisiting that stuff. Uh, just be aware of it and love yourself and hug yourself. Uh, that's that's my advice. Beautiful, Steve. Thanks so yeah. much for um, your inspiration, gents. Do you have anything you'd like to say just on closing? Oh, I'd like to. I'd like to have explored Paul and Nick's work. <laughs> oh, you should absolutely do that. They are brilliant, brilliant photographers in their own right. So, absolutely. You know, I just wanted to acknowledge, you know, and I'm sure it's been done in many ways and and beautifully, officially through OEMs and different things, but just the absolute vastness of of adventure and courageousness of exploring this country and its creatures and beyond and the platform that you've given the Australian people and the people of the world to engage with this this incredible landscape and, it, and it's the intimacy of its creatures is like nothing anyone has ever done and probably will ever do again mm. and I particularly love the way you've engaged young people and children with conversation mm. and, and you've been very thoughtful and and very heartfelt in the way that you've brought brought this world to them and that relationship is is what we need in the world to to keep it alive you know like it's it's relationship to country and its creatures that inspires people to act and live in a way that 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 is sustainable and that that is a legacy that that no one can touch i think beyond what you've created and I love the way that you've you've moved into this realm of of um, creative expression and purpose, and and you're very openly um, present with the spiritual aspect and and the mental health aspect that comes with the creative world, and you're offering these beautiful platforms to people to engage and, and be present without themselves, which I personally am, am very very um, um, very engaged with in, in my own life and. It's mm. been beautiful just to witness, you know, from afar, not being an Aussie. I came in pretty late on the board, but it wasn't very long before 
you know, 25 years ago, I was engaging with your work and, and I already saw that transition into, you know, the young people's world in particular as being quite stand, something that really stood out for me as, as this is a man with a lot of heart and a lot of beauty behind what he's, his purpose is with, with his craftsmanship. And, and I love the fact that right from the beginning, it's not about the camera and it's really not. And that hasn't even been a part of this conversation today at all is, is something that's really going to stay with me for a long time, yep. you yeah. know, as us photographers get a bit caught up in the world. But, but this yeah, I hope to get to meet you one day, Steve. And, and yeah. I, I feel like I've, I've felt the part of who you are that, that, I, that I was less aware of before that I am much more present to now that is really going to stay with me as well from today. So thank you. Yeah. Bless you, Paul. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I fully agree with you, Paul. Um, I um, obviously me and, and many others have been inspired by your work um, over many many years growing up and, and and seeing your beautiful pictures and books and publications and that. But I, I I didn't know really anything much about you on a personal level, Steve. And this conversation that um, we've had today has really shown me what sort of a person that you are, and you're truly a treasure. And I think what's valuable about this video that we've recorded today is it's going to bring um, bring people's appreciation of your your work, um, having seen it in the same formats that we've all seen it over the years, and and really put um, your 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 person, your personality um, into that uh, that work, and and it's given me a, a much deeper appreciation for what you have done and what you continue to do. And um, I, I think just looking at um, your, your masterclass and your your guides, uh, your guide to seeing Australia, I, I was really taken just, just on a, a, a level where you, you've, you've said, see it, hear it and feel it. And the way you described connecting with a location when you get there is, is something that um, is really... Yes. It's really passionate um, part of, of my photography, and it's something that I rue um, the, the the very much the point and shoot and click and move on nature of, mm. of, of travel and social media and that sort of thing, and 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 just that philosophy alone uh, that you've managed to incorporate in a in a travel guide um, is 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 very very valuable and. Um, um, yeah, I just thought I'd, I'd put that in there. It's only a small part, obviously, of what, it, what we've all talked about. But but thank you so much. Um, you know, I, I think thank there's going to be a lot, a lot of people that are going to get a lot of inspiration and and um, and thought about their own journey and their own work from what you said today. And um, we really are deeply appreciative of it. So thank you very much, Steve. Bless you, Nick. Yes. And, and so on that note, um, thanks once again, Steve. Um, if you enjoyed the video today, please also considering liking the video and subscribing to our channel as well. It really does help us bring um, all sorts of um, fantastic guests uh, like Steve to you guys. Um, and um, yeah, until next time, Steve, I'm sure, um, well, I really hope uh, we get to meet in person again and um, yeah, um, um, and keep connected. So thanks so much. Um, and um, yeah. See you later, everybody. Good night. Fan on the big island. <laughs> Thanks, mate.